question. What is the highest individual tax rate under the new tax law? What do you guys think? The highest individual tax rate? 36. We've got a 36. Anybody else? 37. 37. <laughs> Anybody else? Nailed it. Frank nailed it. 37% is the current highest tax rate under the new tax law. Okay, question number two. What's the highest tax rate in the history of the United States? 54. We got a 54? No, 90 something. 90 something? <laughs> Anybody else? Very good. Is 94%. 94% was the highest tax rate in 1944. That was really to pay for World War II. Um, so compare 94 to 37%. I mean, overall, we're in a pretty good tax environment right now. Okay, another question. I get asked a lot. You know, people are concerned with being audited by the IRS, right? Has anybody ever been audited by the IRS? We're amongst friends, okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Just once? Just once. Just once, okay. Nobody else? Okay, what do you think the percentage of individual tax returns is that get audited? For 2016, let me clarify. What percentage of individual tax returns got audited? What do you 3%. think? 3%? That's what I was going to guess. 2. 2. I was going to say 3. 3. Anybody else? 1. 1. Anybody else? 0.6%. 0.6%. Now, last question here. So, what's the number of individual tax returns that got audited for 2016? The actual number of returns that got audited. What'd you say? I'd say a million. A million? 0.6% trying to do the math. About a million? Okay. Anybody else? Close. 985,000. 985,000 returns got selected for audit for the 2016 year. That's the lowest level in 14 years. So you kind of see a pattern here, um, and which, which is what we're going to talk about real quick. Okay, real quick, thanks for everybody coming. Here's kind of our loose agenda today, but we want to keep this informational. So by all means, if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll talk it through. This is pretty casual, uh, but we're going to talk some uh, key takeaways from the tax law change. We're really going to spend a fair amount of time on business changes. A lot of you are business owners. Our firm works with a lot of business owners, so that's very, very key for us today. A couple key areas in the business changes we're going to highlight. Also, we're going to talk about impacts on individual tax returns. And that's a concern for, for most of us in here, your friends, your family, uh, people that might work for you. And just really, we're going to cover the necessity of tax planning. And then we're going to uh, have some time for Q&A. All right, so <coughs> before we get started, I just want to give you all a sense of the climate at the IRS. So this law was massive. It was huge, and it came in very short order. If you remember, if you were following this, um, the co congressional bill came in November of 2017. The Senate passed it in like December 20th, and the president signed it into law on December 22nd. So in short order, this massive legislation was pushed through. So for our friends at the IRS, Bottom line, there's more work for the IRS. More work. Um, some sources say there's 160 systems within the IRS that need to be improved, figured out to implement these new tax law changes. You know, I don't know about your, your businesses, but think about implementing this type of business changes. We've moved to um, is it Skype for Business. We made a move to Skype for Business. And that wasn't an easy process just for our organization. We're about 30 people, and, and that took some. So if you think about implementing 130 changes at the IRS, it's a, it's a big deal. So a big question is, well, will the IRS be able to implement this new tax law while still doing their regular job? You know, regular job, doing audits, you know, diving into certain business returns, et cetera. Um, and then, this mentality, you know, President Trump and the congressional leaders have said their goal is to abolish the IRS. 
They want to abolish the IRS. Um, now, we don't, that's doubtful that's really going to happen, but that, if you think about that's the mindset with the administration, the Congress we have now, more work for the IRS, trying to implement this and do their regular job, bottom line is they're, they're overloaded, right? Okay, so what does that mean for, for you and I? If you think about it, on one hand, um, we talked about those audit rates are going down. So there's a good chance that we're going to continue to see that audit rate continue to decrease. Now, I want everybody to do this. Do you give a fist like this, and then let's knock on wood. <laughs> All right? Um, and this my mentality, do less with less. Treasury themselves said that $400 million is the cost just to implement these IRS, uh, the tax law changes for filing system, for filing season, 400 million. But they got 320 million in the new budget. So you just see where this is headed. So I wanted to paint a picture of our current status here. Uh, any questions on that, comments? Whoops, wrong one. Okay. Who's heard of this qualified business deduction, pass-through deduction, 20% deduction? You've all probably heard about that term. That's the big item in this new tax law, in our opinion. It's, it's a 20% deduction for non-corporate taxpayers. So think about, well, who's a non-corporate taxpayer? It's really everybody but a C corporation is really what it amounts to. So business owners, if you own an S corporation, a partnership, or a sole proprietor Schedule C, you're going to qualify for this business deduction. And 20%, that's a, that's a really good result for business owners. On that, is it, I guess we heard that it does not apply to service related. Very good, budget? very good, yes, yes. And so we're going to dive into that a little okay. bit. Because of course, it couldn't be as simple as a 20% deduction for everyone. There are limitations, there's certain businesses that are excluded, as Kristen, right? Yeah. As Kristen's bringing up. Um, and also, when you think about, we're using this QBI, that's Qualified Business Income. So QBI, it's, it does not include interest income, dividend income, capital gain income, um, or your compensation. Or if you're a partnership, what's called a guaranteed payment to partners. To partners. Okay, so what really qualifies? When you think about qualified business income, what's a qualified business? It has to be in the U.S. U.S. trader business. Um, the other key point here is there can be multiple trades or businesses. Some business owners they they have a lot of different activities going on, so you have to drill down. And if your business has different business lines, you have to segregate each and, and consider that as a separate business for this calculation. Now, here's what Kristen said. Certain service-related businesses are excluded. They're not included in this qualified business income. Accounting firms. We didn't have a strong enough lobby, uh, apparently. Law firms, you know, service-based, you know, think doctors, dentists, optometrists, uh, things of that nature. Um, are, are ineligible, but I'm going to put a little point. We're going to, there's a little bit of an exception, which we'll come back to. Uh, <coughs> and then there's, of course, limitations. So as your taxable income exceeds certain limits, uh, there's some additional calculations that you have to do. Uh, so basically, if you're a single individual, 157.5 is that key number. If you're married filing joint, 315,000 of taxable income is that key key number. And these are the, uh, the, the limitations we're talking about. You'll, you'll hear wage limitation. And then also there's an overall cap at 20% of your taxable income. And this is a lot, and just so you know, this is a big area. It's, it's fairly complex when you go through the calculations. So, our goal is to give you an overview, and then we can dive into any specific questions that you might have. Okay, so, okay. We have a little example here. Um, 
take 20% deduction, okay? So if your business net income of 400,000, if your gross income, all your expenses, okay, so you're left with 400,000, your deduction would be 20% of that, which is 80,000, right? But here's where you gotta go into the, the, the limitation stuff. If you're single, what's that? The limitation's 157.5. So in this example, um, this person has taxable income of 380,000, which is above the phase out. The, in this case, a single, 157.5, he's way, that person's way over that limit. So if you stop here, he does not get, they do not get a deduction for this. But here's the thing. If the, then you look at the wages paid by the business. This person's business, they had 150,000 of wages paid out. So that's helpful. So you can take half of your wages paid out, which is 75,000, and the, the further uh, limitations come down here. So the bottom line for this business owner, although he was completely phased out, because of his tax of income, the fact that he paid wages, they paid wages in the business, they would get a $75,000 deduction for their qualified business income. Um, so I wanted to highlight just the, how the limitation comes into play and then the wage limitation. So that's gonna be very key. Because if you think about, how many of you in your business have employees employed in your business? Okay, most, most. So that's gonna be helpful for this calculation because even if your taxable income goes above these limits, you're still gonna get a deduction based on the amount of wages that you pay. And this can be one of the key points that we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, now, okay, the cer what Kristen brought up, certain service-related businesses are excluded. However, however, the limitation or the, the limit on that is only if your income exceeds those limits that we talked about. So if you're a service business, if you're a, a doctor, a dentist, and your income, so let's go back to this phase out. So if you're a joint taxpayer and you're a, a physician's office, for example, if your taxable income is less than 315,000, you do get the 20% deduction. Um, likewise, if you're single and you're in the consulting services business and you're still under this threshold, you will get the full 20% deduction. Does that make sense? Okay. What about, are there any particular, because this is, again, this is new legislation. There's gonna be regulations and explanation from the IRS that are gonna come out. But think about in your role, the business owners, either your business or other industries, other people you know, are there certain service businesses that you're thinking about that there's, there's a question whether or not that would qualify? Anything come to mind? So what about like a landscaping business or a consulting business? Which one would qualify? Yeah, so in that example, you think about the real key what they're trying to do on these service businesses is if it's really a service related to an individual, they're very specialized, their reputation is what's driving that. You know, think of a law firm, big time lawyer downtown, people were going to see that lawyer because of their individual reputation. Versus say a landscaper, um, they do a great job in landscaping, but it's not really tied into that individual's personal skill set. Does that make, make sense? Okay. Now Jason, I was talking to Jason. Jason owns an insurance agency, right? So there's, there is an exclusion. It's talking about if you are in the business of providing investment advice. You guys, right? You got, you're like accountants. We didn't have a tough enough lobby, I, I guess. But um, I met with an insurance agent, talked to some, and so their industry is kind of saying, well, we might be in that investment advisory business, and so maybe there's a gray area. But from what I understand, it, you're in the product, you're not really, part of what you could do could be considered that, but maybe your routine, hey, we're, we're providing premiums to business owners. So that's not really a, an investment type activity. But 
But the point is, there's still some gray area here. And that's why we're going to have to wait for some of these regulations to come up. Any other questions on that? OK, so again, that's a big one, big one. So what are some key takeaways in this qualified business? Again, think about if there's different lines of business in your, in your company, you really need to track those separately. A common example, think of an optometrist. They're providing services and optometry, but they also a lot of times have a retail store, right? So those are two separate line of businesses. So his optometry practice is going to be excluded, but the retail operation could qualify for this. Compensation. I had a business owner call me, and he said, well, shoot, I've heard about this deduction. Um, I'll just lower my, my compensation to drive up my business income. That's a great idea, isn't it? Well, not maybe, but not exactly. So, uh, but it, it points to the issue of really reviewing compensation. You know, maybe you're a business owner and you're not paying yourself wages. There's a different issue with that, but it might make sense to, okay, I'm gonna bump up my wages that I pay to myself to drive up that wage limitation that we just talked about and get some of a benefit for this qualified business deduction. Now there's a payroll tax implication, but working through that could make some sense. Another one, maybe you have independent contractors in your business and it, maybe it's questionable if they're really an employer or an independent contractor. It might make sense to really put them on the payroll. Yes, you'll have some payroll tax, but your deduction here might yield a, a better benefit. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention. So back to the, the business owner I spoke with. Well, I'm just going to drop my compensation. So in this situation, that business owner was taking wages of 300000 And he'd been doing that for years. So now if he dropped his wages to 100000 all of a sudden to take advantage of this deduction, my concern would be, wow, the IRS is going to see and pay yourself three hundred thousand. <coughs> Why did you drop it to a hundred thousand? You know, so those are issues you really have to think through before you make some drastic changes in the compensation. Another one we're talking to our business owner clients about is understanding the impact for you personally on this deduction, so that if you're making estimated tax payments for the year, you don't want to be overpaying to the IRS. So. Consider updating your estimated tax payments in light of your potential benefit for this deduction. Another one, possibly if, if you have a married situation and one spouse has a business and the other doesn't, kind of working through those thresholds, it might make sense for that business owner spouse to file their own return versus a joint return, potentially putting you over that filing threshold. So, so keep that in mind. If you have a situation, uh, multiple or spouses with, with businesses. Um, I just mentioned that. And then this is probably a good time to evaluate your entity structure. Um, you know, C corporations are taxed at 21% now. But what we're seeing a lot of business owners ask, well, I'm an S corporation, should I be an LLC? Or I'm an LLC, tax as a partnership should I be an S corporation there's some details that you need to go through but one of the big ones is um, does anybody own an S corporation in here okay several um, what does an S corporate maybe you've heard from your account but what does an S corporation need to do for the owner what does the owner have to take out of an S corporation owners equity yeah, they have to take reasonable compensation. So if you own an S corporation and you're the owner and you put nothing on your W-2, that's a problem. So think of an S corp who has to take owner compensation, which drives down your qualified business income, but could help you for the, the wage limitation that we talked about. Whereas if you're a partnership, you're not required to take compensation. So that could drive up your qualified business income. Again, there's, there's a fair amount of complexity when you go through these calculations, but just know there, there are items to think about in this. 
Okay, before I move on, any other questions in this in this area? Okay. So okay, there's there's some other changes to business owners. Uh, we just picked some of the key changes we want to mention. Who knows what a NOL is? Very good. Net operating loss. You know that happens. Businesses have a tough year. In the past, I've seen businesses buy a bunch of equipment, take a lot of depreciation, resulting in a net operating loss. Well, this is a problem under the new law because now you're limited to only offset 80% of your taxable income with an NOL. Used to be, if you had an NOL, it would wipe out all your income and you pay zero tax. And if you had more to go, you could carry that loss back to prior year, the past two years, and get a big refund back for any tax that you paid in those years. Well, these are cut hard. You're, you're limited here, and you cannot carry an NOL back to the prior two years. It will carry forward indefinitely, but you can't carry it back. Another one is business interest deduction is limited to 30% of your taxable income. That could be a big for some businesses, but thankfully they put a small business exception. So if your business is under 25 million in gross receipts or gross revenue, this does not apply to you. And just so you know, so a lot of real estate development, construction, you know, heavy debt companies are excluded from this uh, limitation. Last thing I want to mention, uh, do we have any manufacturers in here? Okay, won't spend a lot of time on this, but this was a very good deduction, which is gone now. But it doesn't apply to you, so I won't spend time on it. Who's heard of changes in the uh, meals and entertainment area? That's no good, right? We love to take clients, prospects, out to dinner, to Reds games. Well, maybe not Reds games. Oh, yeah, they turned into Reds. <laughs> Frank's still hopeful. He's still hopeful. That's good. But uh, as we all probably know, you would take a client or somebody, employees, to a Reds game, a Bengals game, Xavier, UC, whatever. If there was a business purpose, you could get a deduction for 50% of that. Well, guess what? They took that away. So entertainment, amusement, recreation, there's just no deduction anymore for that. Um, you know, some of us were uh, members of certain clubs, you know, business, social clubs, and we said, hey, there's a, there's a business benefit to joining this club. I'm going to get a 50% deduction. Well, they, they've taken that away too. So they've really taken some action. So the, the, the reason behind this, let's face it, you know, trying to substantiate a business purpose for a lot of these, the IRS said, you know, we're just done with that. You're just, we're not gonna, we're not gonna allow that. Um, so Chad, just to yeah, clarify, yeah. the dues I put pay to belong to a chamber of commerce are no longer deductible? We think th those are okay. Chamber of commerce. It says business, right? Right. And we belong to several trade associations and advocacy yeah. groups. So you think that's an iffy proposition? Or I what? think that's okay. I, I think the real point here was um, Queen City Club downtown. Um, those type of clubs where you could say, Mike could say, hey, our business joined the Queen City Club to meet other business owners, entertain clients down there. So there's a, there's a business purpose for that. But routine uh, association dues, chamber dues, we think those are okay. Do you agree? I certainly agree as a chamber Adam, president. Come here, Frank. I, I, want, I want everybody to join the chamber, yes. Yeah. So we're going to see me afterwards, okay. Um, let's see, okay. Now, there's some misconception, we believe, in the, the meals and entertainment with for this. So if you take a potential client out to lunch, um, to discuss business, we think that meal would still be allowable. So that we, there's really no change in that rule, what we believe right now. 
But I will tell you, that's still maybe a gray area because they could say, well, that meal's really entertainment, so we're going to disallow that. So just so you know, we think at this point, the traditional taking a client prospect out for a lunch, you're still going to get a 50% deduction for that. But we're looking for future regular. My brother used to sell commercial ink. Sold a million dollars a month. Mm -hmm. A lot of his clients was he went to the golf course or he rented a limo and took him out of the town on the night. Absolutely. Now, he was still working. He's an old party. He can't work anymore. Uh, would, he, would that be considered tax deductible or not? No. I didn't think so. No. Good thing he's that's, not retired. <laughs> that's a great thing. Golf, that's a big one, right? Yeah. Um, if you pay for greens fees, uh, card fees, etc. That expense, yeah, no deduction for. What about sponsorship? That's not okay. Yes, we're saying that is. So if you sponsor a golf outing, what's that? It's advertising, right? That's a hundred percent deduction. Keep in, our, in our opinion. Right. Any other questions on this topic? I just read the other day that the AICPA has made some very compelling arguments to the IRS to allow the deduction for, for meals. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's what we like to hear because we, again, we, we, we're all business owners. That's a natural part of our business. Um, again, what I, 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 we're comfortable, at least at this point, that that will continue, but we'd love to see additional pressure by industry associations to make sure that's very crystal clear in the new regulations. Let me throw a couple more at you, yeah. if you don't mind. Sure. So when we um, start new employees and they come into an orientation, we just had six people in an orientation on Monday, we take them out to lunch. You know, in the midst of that all-day orientation, they yep. need to eat, we take them out to a restaurant for lunch. Yep. Is that deductible or not deductible? 50%. Okay, that's what 50 I thought. 50% deduction. Is that because it's employees and not clients? Well, I think in a client, we still feel like the client situation would still be 50%. So that's, um, it's, it's very similar. You know, the business purpose there is, hey, these are new employees, we wanna integrate them into the firm, and so we're, we're still 50%. Uh, Any other questions on this? This is, a, this is a big one. People are asking a lot of questions, and you know. Okay. So, um, I, I, got, I got another one for you. Yeah. You know, um, the management team. Somebody on the management team, it's their birthday. Yeah. Management team goes out to lunch. Yeah. 50% or no? We think 50%. Okay. Yep. Yep. You can't take away birthday lunch. That's the best part of the year. Right, right. Okay, last, last point on this and we'll move on. Documentation. Documentation, okay. I've been doing this about 25 years. I've been through dozens of IRS audits. Uh, I'm gonna look at my colleague, Debbie. What is an account, what is an account that every IRS auditor is gonna look at, Debbie? Meals and entertainment. Yes, they're, I mean, they're gonna look at that. That's the low hanging fruit for them. If you don't have the proper dis, uh, documentation, they'll deny the whole deduction. They'll say, well, we're disallowing everything because you, the burden of proof is on you as the business owner taxpayer to document the business purpose who was there, where you were. And so that's really key, especially in this new environment because this is gonna be an area that they're gonna to continue to look at. Now I wanna share one thing. So um, what we do in our business, we have, uh, where's my phone? Okay, so it's recording. That's okay, okay. So we have, can I see your phone? So our firm uses a, a Technology. So if I take somebody out to lunch, or really any business receipt, I open up my app, I take a picture of that receipt, and it's stored securely, and actually it updates our accounting system automatically. And so thanks, I mean, he didn't actually do it, but, um, but it's very helpful to secure those documents because three years down the road, if we were audited, we could pull up that documentation and it's right there. So just know, I mean, document, yeah. What's the app? It's called Receipt Bank. Receipt Bank. And that, that assuming you, you're using QuickBooks? Yeah, QuickBooks Online. Now, you may have to license that. Uh, we can talk about that after the fact. I don't know that they've made it available to the general public yet, but. OK. 
can follow up with us, Mike. We'll, we'll get you some information on that. Uh, okay, let's go on here. How am I doing on time, Diane? Good? Okay. Uh, some more key take takeaways, you know, net operating loss. Just know that there's these limitations, so if there are timing of expenses, just make sure you're coordinating that so you're not left with a big NOL that you can't use. We already talked about that. Another thing, so as a business owner, you have uh, QuickBooks or some general ledger. What we're doing with our business owner clients is just to review the accounting structure so that as you encounter these different type of expenses, you just want to make sure they're properly classified to make your life easier uh, when it's tax filing time. Okay. Now, different area. Uh, capital investment, you buy computers, furniture, fixtures, uh, things like that for your business. We've been in a great environment the last several years. So who, who's heard the term Section 179 depreciation? Okay, a lot of you. That says that if you buy a piece of equipment, you can write the whole thing off in year one versus taking depreciation over, say, five years. So it's, it's a really good benefit. Now, this thing started out at 25000 years ago. They slowly increased it. Last year, it was 500000 For this year, it's up to $1 million now. So think about maybe, maybe not all your businesses are going to encounter that, but the people you know and you talk to, it's a great time to buy equipment because um, you get to write it all off. There's this limitation. If you exceed 2.5 million, they start to reduce what you can take, but it's a pretty big spend. Um, now there's, a, a, again, a couple exceptions. There's some limitations. So taking that deduction, you're limited to your taxable income in the business. So if your taxable income is, say, zero, you, you can't take the full section 179. If your taxable income is 100,000, you can take up to 100000 Does that make sense? Would leasehold improvements fall into that category? Yeah, so you're, you're, here, here's a big one, okay? Certain qualified real property now qualifies for the Section 179. It used to be, it was, it was very clear, movable equipment, and desks, computers, <coughs> uh, machines, that type of thing. Well, now they've brought the definition, so certain qualified improvement real property does qualify now. This is this is a big one. So Mike's on it because look at it. That's where the action is. This qualified real property. So the bit, a couple of big ones, you know, roofs, heating, ventilate, HVAC stuff, um, security systems. Those used to be ineligible for the 179. Well, now they qualify. Um, in other general. Uh, qualified real property improvements also qualify. Now, for example, think of this, okay, pretty much all qualified improvements to property qualify, with some exceptions. It has to be to an interior portion of a non-residential property. Think of this building right here that you're sitting in. If we do a major improvement, we can take 179 on that. Um, it does have to be, the improvement has to be placed in service after the day the main building was first placed in service. That's another exception. So, um, just again to get real specific and clear, you know, I take over an existing building or a portion of that mm -hmm. for a new location for us. Yep. We got it. Yep. All of that counts. Well, not all. Okay, here, let me put one more. This enlargement of a building, elevator, escalator, or interior interior structural framework. So in other words, new walls, the studs for the new walls, the drywall. That doesn't count. That gets excluded. That um, stinks. It does stink. What it about does stink. something like this little kitchen here? Yes, that would qualify. Um, the big one we see a lot is, is roofs. You know, you own a facility. Those are not cheap to replace, right? So you can write that all off. Any other questions on this one? I don't have a question directly on this, but if you make a move, 
Like you made a move from Fairfield to here. Yep. Okay. I would have to get new sign because I'm thinking it's, I have to get new signage. I'm moving prop. I may have to get new equipment. Whatever the case is, do I get any benefit out of that? Yes. Yes. Yes, you do. In fact, great example. We just moved, as you point out. We had moving expenses to get here. Um, one of our exterior signs is out there. We've got two more to come. Those will be eligible for this deduction. So yeah, you get a, how much of a deduction is that? Fifty percent or a hundred percent? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So if you think about it, in this type of situation, that was a good incentive for us to move. It wasn't the motivating factor, but it's like. Hey, that's great. It's just a benefit for businesses too. You know, the idea is to invest in equipment, invest in your business. Okay. Here's a, who's heard of bonus depreciation? Okay. This is very similar to the 179. Uh, again, 100% deduction for this, this property. The big difference here is the old rule, the equipment that you bought had to be brand new. Brand new. Oh, yeah. yeah, new equipment. Now, the new, the new law says it can be new or used equipment. That's key, used equipment. We had uh, many business owners, you know, if you're buying large stuff, a lot of times you have to get a used piece of heavy machinery, et cetera. And, we hated to tell taxpayers, well, it's used. We can't take the bonus depreciation. Uh, but now, used equipment qualifies, so you can write off 100% of that equipment. Isn't that a huge advantage for a manufacturing company? Yes, yes, it's a huge advantage. Um, I was working with a business owner, bought a million dollar piece of equipment, we got to write the entire thing off, which made his taxable income for the year go away. It's a huge, it's a huge benefit, and it's that incentive to be out there buying equipment and doing new things. Now, the bad news, it starts to phase out. In 2024, it drops down to 60% of the write-off, uh, 40, 20, and after 2026, it goes away at this point. They might renew it, but at this point, it goes away. So keep that in mind as you're planning. Just know that there's- Excuse me, isn't that counter to what? federal government wants commerce growth, and if you're taking away that depreciation, you're discouraging growth. I mean, we've, we've had Pacific Manufacturing at over $50, 50 million in renovation. We had Machine Tech wanting to double the size of what they had, right? And if they cannot get the tax incentives, that is gonna really cut into that commerce growth. Absolutely. So I don't think the IRS is talking to the other branches of federal government. You're right, you're right. I mean, this is, a, it's a major incentive. And if it goes away, you're right, that's going to dry up. We're hopeful that they, that they reconsider that as we get closer to 2026, but, but who knows. Yeah, I mean, the business owner I was referencing, if it weren't for that deduction, he likely wouldn't have bought that million dollar piece of equipment. Any other questions on this? Could you, may I ask if you yeah. could just send me a piece of that because I want to forward it to the Congress of Davidson. Okay, all right. I want him to know that uh, this is something that uh, the Chamber of Commerce is on. Okay, part of. yes, we will do that. Okay, just one point here. Um, beware of state conformity. I was talking to Frank earlier. earlier. So federal government is kind of generous. Not all states are as generous. So the big thing to watch here is this bonus depreciation, this 179. Federal, you get a full, you know, no problem, but the state of Ohio doesn't allow it. So you have to add back that for your Ohio purposes. <laughs> they, let, they let you take it, but it's over six years. So you get, you get it eventually, but you don't get the big bang for your buck at the state level. And all states are a little bit different, so just be aware of that. Uh, get good invoicing from whoever's doing the work for you. And then there's some elections you have to do with your tax return, so just be be aware of that. Okay, Diane, how are we doing on time? Nine twenty. Okay, so now we're moving into individual tax uh, 
uh, issues or changes, and there's a lot, there's a lot of changes. We picked some of the highlights we wanted to present to you. So the good, tax rates across the board are lower. They're just all lower, which is good. Many of the business owners and individuals we've seen, they're, they're, almost all of them are benefiting under this new legislation, which is great news. A big item is capital gains. Uh, you know, you get favorable tax treatment for capital gains and qualified dividends. There's been no change in that, so that's, that's a good result. 20% is the top rate you would pay on capital gains and qualified dividends. Um, there's an increased estate uh, exemption. Used to be, well, currently it's, uh, well, in 2017, about 5.6 million. They doubled that, 11.2-ish, right? So if you have an estate of 11.2 or under, you pay zero federal estate tax. So that's a, that's a very good benefit for, for those type of people who have uh, those type of estates. AMT, you probably heard of that. Um, some of th that was meant to really attack the higher taxpayers, but over the years, just more middle income type folks were getting hit with this AMT. Well, they've raised the exemption for AMT, so now um, they've doubled it. So there, we should see kind of the regular moderate income should should not be impacted by that AMT as much. Uh, the health care shared responsibility that goes away starting in 2019. 529 plans, uh, which Kristen knows all about. Yes, but be careful because what you just said about the state, so Ohio has not accepted it yet. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. Which sucks. Yes, yeah. You're talking about the Ohio state. So, well, no, I'm talking about for using. I guess I should have been more specific. Using 529s for oh. um, primary expenses. Okay. So this, the federal government said, yes, you can use 529s for primary school now, and the states are not there yet. Okay. So, and then the, they raised the deduction. Okay. But yeah. you can't use it for primary. Okay. You still have to use it for primary. So okay. Yeah, yeah. More specific. <laughs> yeah, so uh, again, you see that play. States always don't cooperate with what the federal government wants to do. This is a good one. Increase, who has kids? There's an increased child credit from 1,000 to 2,000. But the big one here is they've raised the, the limit. Used to be, there was a, about $100,000 if your income was above that, you, you did not get to take the child tax credit. They've raised that significantly. It's like 400,000-ish. So if your income is below 400,000, you'll get a full tax credit for kids. Remind me the ages, is that 18 and under? 17 and under, right Debbie? Yeah. 17 and under. Okay. Does that work for you? No. Oh, oh darn. But it's still not worth having more kids. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Pay more tax. Yeah, that's right. We did not put that as a takeaway. <laughs> so good. And this is, um, Increased standard deduction, I mean, most of you know, you either take the itemized deductions or the standard deduction. If your itemized deductions are lower than your standard, you just take the standard deduction, and they've increased that significantly. Uh, if you're married, you get 24,000 standard deduction. This was part of trying to make the taxes easier, so you don't have to, if you're, if you're under that limit, as far as your itemized deductions, you really don't have to track all your individual itemized deductions, you just know you're going to take the $24,000. Um, so, the bad. The NOL limitations that we talked about. This is a big one people have heard about. You can no longer, well, I'm just, let me say that. Your state and local taxes are capped at $10,000. That includes real estate taxes, state and local income tax. <laughs> $10,000 is the max you can take. I've received a lot of questions from people on this issue. And it's, it's bad. I, mean, I know somebody lives in Florida. Real estate taxes in Florida are off the charts, and that deduction is going to be capped at $10,000. But I'll say in that person's situation, they still benefited because of the overall tax rate being lower. So don't 
freak out when you hear this, just know that you might be made up in other areas via the lower tax rates. Now, one, one point of clarification on this too. If you're a business owner, or if you own real estate, rental real estate, this doesn't apply. So in other words, the taxes you pay in your business, you're still getting a full deduction for that. If you own a rental property and you pay real estate taxes for the rental property, you're still okay there. I've had some questions about that. So are you saying state, local, and real estate? Yeah, that would fall into the, the, the local kind of okay. So state and local income tax and real estate taxes. On, in, a, in a personal scenario. Right. Mortgage interest, I've received a lot of questions on this too. The, the big change here is under the old law, if your mortgage was a million or less, you got a full deduction for your mortgage interest. They've dropped that limitation to 750000 So as long as your mortgage is under 750000 no change. If you go above that, you start to get a phase out of your deduction. This is a big one too. Home equity, interest, no longer get a deduction for that. You know, it's common, get a home equity loan, pay off credit cards, buy a vehicle, whatever, no longer get a deduction for that home equity interest. Miscellaneous itemized deductions are gone. You know, a lot of folks have unreimbursed job expenses, um, tax prep fees, hate to mention that one, but um, uh, union dues, things like that are these miscellaneous itemized deductions. They're just gone. Investment expenses. Investment expenses, sorry. But the fact, what we try to tell people is, Generally, you didn't get a big bang for the buck on that stuff anyway. Or what we say, try to do it on your own. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, the value exceeds that, absolutely. So here's one that uh, we just wanted to mention. You know, some folks are like, well, if I'm only taking the standard deduction, I'm losing some of my itemized deductions. And that's going to be true if you're right on that border. Say, if, if you're... Um, if you're married, filing joint, and you, um, if your standard deduction will be twenty-four thousand. If your itemized deductions, you know, charitable contributions, mortgage interest, or ten thousand dollars state and local tax, if all that stuff adds up to less than twenty-four thousand, you get twenty-four thousand standard. If you're right on that border. You know, right in that kind of right in that area. What we thought you might consider is maybe you accelerate some of your itemized deductions in one year, thereby increasing above the twenty-four thousand, and then the following year you'll just get the twenty-four thousand standard deduction. Uh, okay. The other one, personal or dependent exemptions are gone. You know, the exemption for kids, for uh, yourself. There's that's just gone. Now. The rationale is, well, we've increased the standard deduction to kind of make up for that. But some key takeaways here. Um, just make sure you're reviewing your withholding. If you receive a W-2, make sure you're reviewing your withholding on that. And again, reevaluate if you're making estimated tax payments. Just make sure you're checking that to make sure you're on track. Um, see Kristen to invest in a 2529 plan. The deductions double now. Deductions double at the state level. Okay. From two to four thousand. Okay. That's kid. something, right? That's good. Uh, just take a look if you have home equity loans. Just take a look at that. Maybe there's a way to restructure that. And then review your estate plan. the The annual gifting limit is now fifteen thousand, so you can give up to fifteen thousand per individual without a gift tax consequence. Okay, so we're moving towards the end here. Just we want everybody to be educated, plan for these changes, could optimize your cash flow. I mean, as you reevaluate these uh, estimated tax requirements, or as you implement these changes in your business, you can see a result on your bottom line. We're just trying to help everybody understand the unknown. I mean, as we talked about, this was big, massive legislation. There's a lot in it. Honestly, we're still digesting all this as, as a profession. But if you do these things, 
what we're trying to accomplish is just peace of mind for, for you as individuals and for business owners. Uh, do the best we can to understand it, implement what we can. Hopefully it gives you more peace of mind for this year. Any, any questions, any final issues you want to bring up? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, I got a question on uh, QBI, income, net income. Yeah. Um, for sole proprietorships because they're following Schedule C. Yep. And um, self-employment tax and medical costs are not included in Schedule C. Right. So what, what number would sole proprietors use? To get to 20%, they get to qualify for 20% discount. Right. So it would be the net income on the Schedule C. Okay. So in other words, um, you would not have to reduce it by the health insurance and the SE tax deduction. Right? Debbie, you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any others? On the 529 question, so you said you can do up to 10000 for private religious education. Right. But is, that, is there a change with how those, I mean, are, is that in some way deductible now on federal taxes? No. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think so. Yeah. I just want to make no sure. change there. No okay. change there. It's just what you can use the money on. I got it. It's kind of changed. Okay. And a side note, those are good uh, plans because it separates some assets into that plan, which is protected from creditors and just kind of give, gives you another bucket to put some assets. Any others? I'm going to go back to meals and entertainment. Okay. So we shut down twice a year okay. for um, recertification, recertification, CPR, lots of different things, training, right? And part of that is we're compelled to do. So we've, we're shut down. We've got the whole the entire company there. We're bringing in stuff for breakfast, we're, like you did today. We're bringing in lunches. My assumption that's 100. percent We would say that's 50 percent. Okay. Okay. That's a change. That's a change. That that was a change. It used to be 100 percent, right, Debbie? Yeah. Right? That's yep. That's correct. That used to that's a change. Uh, okay. There's no more 100 percent. All right. So um, let's say just for grins. The boss stops at the donut shop on the way in and brings in donuts for everybody. Is that 50%? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. So really, any time you use your people, it's 50%. Yeah. So it's really just the entertainment. That's the big. That's the big takeaway for, for me, and I think for us is, yeah, the Reds game, Bengals game, golf. What like about food at the Reds game? See, uh, that's <laughs> a great point. I believe that would be allowable. If you really got into the details and said, these were the Reds tickets, nope. This was the, the food that we bought down there, 50% deduction. It's back to that documentation now. Right. You know, the burden is on you. Right. I don't think the Reds break that out for you. I think you buy, I mean, most yeah. of the party groups, I think you buy a ticket that includes yeah. both. So, I mean, you could make a case, but yeah, I agree. So you'd have to document it then. Yeah. So the entertainment, like if like I know like Kirsch does, and all, every company does, you take your people out to do something after tax season. You guys all are still standing and breathing. Or, you know, our our parks is going to do something. So yeah. we're going to go to Keelan, You know, for I mean, Kirsch did that many years ago. Yeah. Um, so that would be non deductible because that would be like considered entertainment, right? Um. <laughs> Now there's gonna be food. Yeah, and yeah. I think I think the Keeneland trip would be not allowed. Now the food and other things that you can carve out, I think you would still get a fifty percent. I tell you what else. I just throw this out because I have a client being edited right now. Is the the gifts, the employee gifts, and this gifts to business owners. Those are twenty five dollars per person per year. Okay, so that, that brings up another. <laughs> this is a huge. <laughs> That's not new. That's not yeah, new. This is, so this is huge that companies are doing to, you know, be, you know, good to their employees, sure. their service, their, you know, like I have a friend who's going to um, give up to $1,500 to each employee that he got carved out by for trip expenses. So, because they want their employees to go away, yeah. you know, recharge, relax, yeah. go do something. If you give people money, they're probably not going to book a ticket. It's not deductible. So, so they, all those. It's not deductible. 
dollars per person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless you run towards payroll. Yeah. Now, see, that was, that's what I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. You might reconsider. Mm -hmm. I know the employees aren't going to like it, but it's well, a business maybe. decision. Okay, yeah. we're going to we're going to compensate yeah, you, you for fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, we're going to cover your tax. Yeah. 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 So can we just? I may just be looking at the same question, but this one kind of just mind sure. blown. Um, so if I give one. Okay, well thank you all. I'm gonna Diane's gonna have some final